in the previous discussion, we've considered only static models, models where all of the samples drawn are completely independent from one another. But as in the discussion of neural networks and recurrent neural networks, we may also want to consider situations where the data are drawn sequentially from the same model over time and there is some kind of ordering to them. This might be a similar kind of model to the Gaussian mixture model, where the observations depend on some hidden state, but the hidden state may evolve over time. If the states at different times were all independent from one another, so there was no dependence on sequence, then uh, the fact that they were drawn at different times would be irrelevant, and this would be just the same as a bunch of independent draws, which we might consider just with a Gaussian mixture model or some other such latent variable model. For us to be interested in the fact that the model is sequential, that the states vary over time, there must be some relationship between the states at different times. So we would expect the state to be at least conditional on the present state of the system. If the state of the system at the next time step depends only on the current state, then the process is said to be Markovian or to have the Markov property. This is often expressed as being memoryless. It doesn't matter what sequence of steps it took to get to the current state, only the current state matters in determining the next state. Here we would say that the past and the future are conditionally independent given the present. The way that states change over time will be governed by what we will call transition probabilities. These determine the probability that if we are in state A at one time step, we will change to be in state B at the next time step. If the set of transition probabilities in the system remain the same over time, so they don't evolve, then the process is said to be time homogeneous. We're only going to consider time homogeneous Markov processes here. We can represent this behavior of changing between states with defined probabilities in a graph form here, where the nodes represent the states and the edges represent the transitions from state to state. Alternatively, we can represent this graph in matrix form, where all of the entries in the matrix represent the probability of going from one state to another, in particular, the element at row i and column j will represent the probability of transitioning from state i to state j. We can define this model, the hidden Markov model, the model of evolving hidden states with no memory, driving external observations that we can make in terms of the following variables and parameters. We have a sequence of t external observation vectors x, x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xt. Those external observations are conditioned on the hidden state, which we'll represent with the scalar value z. So we're considering a finite number of distinct, discrete internal states. We can represent these just with uh, integer indices from 1 up to K, which will be our number of hidden states. The relationship between the internal state and the observation that we make will be governed by some conditional probability distribution Px given z, which is parameterized by theta. We get to decide what the kind of emission distribution looks like, but for example, we might choose for it to be a Gaussian, much like the Gaussians in our Gaussian mixture model. We also need something which defines the probability distribution over the initial states of the model. This will just be a categorical distribution, a vector of k probabilities that sum to 1, expressing how likely it is 
that the initial state of the model is each of the k possible z's. Finally, we will have a transition matrix A, which expresses the chance at each time step, given that you're in one state of transitioning to another. Since they are probabilities, all of the rows in this transition matrix will need to sum to one. If you're in a state, you have to go somewhere. The diagonal entries of this matrix express the probability that you're in the same state next step as you are currently, so the uh, probability that you just don't do anything. As mentioned, we are going to only deal with time homogeneous Markov models here, and so the uh, transition matrix A is constant throughout the sequence. It never changes. Given this kind of definition, which is perhaps a bit abstract, there are a number of different sorts of problem we might want to address. For example, given a series of observations, x1, x2, etc., we might like to know what the probability is that the hidden state is a particular hidden state at any given time step. Sort of equivalently, we might like to know how likely the parameters are of the model. Given a set of observations, we might like to be able to fit the model parameters and given a sequence of observations, we might like to be able to translate that into the sequence of hidden states that give rise to it. All of these kinds of problems will require us in some way to consider all of the possible routes through the different sequences of states that might have taken place. But this is computationally intractable because the number of possible sequences grows exponentially at every time step. Fortunately, practical algorithms are made possible because of the Markov property. Because the future is conditionally independent of the past, given the present, we only need to consider one set of probabilities at each time step. So the observation at any time step t, xt, depends only on the hidden state at that time step, zt. And the hidden state, zt, depends only on the hidden state at the immediately previous time step, zt minus 1. To consider the probabilities at each time step, we don't need to care about how we got there, so the combinatorial explosion sort of collapses at each time step, as we keep having to pass through a bottleneck of just the immediate present probabilities. We can calculate the sequence probabilities like this. So the probability of the complete sequence of observations up to t, and the current state, zt, is the probability of the observation at time t, xt, given the state zt, multiplied by the sum over the possible previous states of the probability of the current state, given the previous state, multiplied by the probability of the sequence up to the previous time step and the previous state. This can be represented in what's known as a trellis diagram, which looks like this. Each of the columns represents a particular time step, each of the nodes represents the state at that time step, and the routes through the sequence are represented by the arrows. Taking this into account gives us algorithms for solving all of the different kinds of problems that we thought about in relation to hidden Markov models. So for calculating probabilities and likelihoods, you can use something known as the forward algorithm, which starts at the beginning of the sequence and iterates forwards at each step, considering the evidence up to that point. This thinks about only the things that have happened before and is known as filtering. A slightly more complex version of the same thing is the forward-backward algorithm. This considers not only the evidence of the past, but also the evidence of the future and is known as smoothing. So it will compute the forward probabilities, the alphas exactly as for the forward algorithm, but it will also do a complementary pass starting at the end of the sequence and working its way back 
computing the probability of all of the remaining sequence given that you started in a particular state. If we want to infer the most likely sequence of unseen states given the observations that we did see, we can use something known as the Viterbi algorithm. This process is often known as decoding the sequence. This is very similar to the forward algorithm, but rather than summing over the probabilities at each step, it instead just picks whichever was the highest, so it takes the maximum rather than the sum, and it also records which of the previous states gave rise to that maximum probability of then arriving at the particular state in the new time step. This proceeds throughout the entire sequence. And then at the end, the likeliest sequence is identified from the end state. And all of these back pointers are followed back through the sequence to find the likeliest entire sequence. This process of going all the way through to the end and then reconstructing backwards is necessary because just going forwards isn't sufficient because you can't tell what might happen after. What may seem like the highest likelihood uh, state to be in at a particular time step early on may actually not lead to any plausible sequences later. So all of these algorithms, the forward algorithm, the forward-backward algorithm, and the Viterbi al algorithm, all presuppose that we already have a fitted model. We know what the transition probabilities are. To actually fit the model from observed data, we would use the Baum-Welch algorithm, which, surprise, surprise, is a form of expectation maximization. This uses the forward backward algorithm to estimate the forward and backward probabilities for each state at each time step, and it uses those to estimate the likelihood of the model parameters. The probabilities of the transitions can then be estimated from your soft estimates of the likelihood of being in each state at each time, so you'll have a big population of uh, weighted uh, occupancies of the different states and then the fraction of times in which each of those led to the similarly weighted soft occupancies of a different state and you calculate the transition probabilities from aggregating over all of those. You can also then similarly calculate the emission probabilities, the probabilities of seeing uh, each observation given the particular internal state by again taking a weighted sum over all of those cases where you were in that state and the thing that you observed. What parameters you would estimate then will depend on the emission distribution that you have chosen. But so if that was a Gaussian, for example, then you would estimate means and covariances from the population in a very similar way to the Gaussian mixture models. If you were estimating a categorical distribution, you would do it by taking a weighted sum of the outputs versus the inputs in a similar way to the class memberships estimated with the Gaussian mixture models. So hidden Markov models originally rose to prominence in speech applications and in natural language processing, as with uh, many things that are dealing with sequential data. These have probably been rather overshadowed these days by recurrent neural networks, but hidden Markov models are still widely used in other fields, notably bioinformatics, for estimating things like gene sequences. I'll just briefly give an example of a useful hidden Markov model application from my own distant past, which is in estimating ion channel kinetics from single channel recording data. You what? As mentioned back in week five in the discussion of biological neurons, neuronal processing and excitability depends very heavily on very detailed minute control of the flows of charged particles into and out of the cell. A key component in this process is a bunch of different kinds of proteins known collectively as ion channels. And these are molecules that traverse the cell membrane and they allow uh, ions to flow through them selectively. 
these proteins exist in a number of different conformations, a different number of different shapes, and they move between those conformations very rapidly and stochastically, conditioned on various environmental factors, such as the presence of neurotransmitters or charge differences, potential differences across the cell membrane. Some of these conformations will allow the ions to pass into and out of the cell and others won't. The current flows through these ion channels, they're single proteins remember, are extremely tiny of the order of trillionths of an amp. But through the wonders of technology, a lot of very uh, painstaking experimental protocols, and the development of extremely sensitive amplifiers, it is possible to measure the flows of current through individual ion channels. This gives rise to experimental data that looks like this. In these recordings, the conformational state of the ion channel, the particular physical spatial configuration that it happens to be in at any time point, is a hidden variable, but it governs the amount of current that is flowing through, which, are, which is measured in these traces. So the ups and downs that you see in these traces are literally showing the movements of a single molecule in basically real time. From data like this, using a hidden Markov model, it is possible to estimate both what states the channel is in and also how those states uh, relate to one another and what the transition probabilities between them are. This may seem very abstract, but small changes in these probabilities brought about by environmental factors or by chemical agents such as drugs can have a significant impact on the functioning of the neurons and that can build up to all sorts of changes in brain function which can lead to uh, changes in mental health or changes in neurophysiology that might have physical consequences. Being able to experimentally monitor how particular chemical agents, for example, drugs can affect and modulate the behavior of these single molecules in the brain is important for pharmacological research in terms of figuring out what things might have what kind of effects and be useful for treating what kinds of conditions. So what we've seen from the latent variable models that we've looked at today is that by imposing some kind of structure which doesn't have to be all that prescriptive onto data that we don't have labels for, we are able to parse out all kinds of information about the processes giving rise to that data. These approaches are not guaranteed to give correct or useful answers, but they often do. And this is really the essence of unsupervised learning in general. We impose some kind of structure on the data and we see what it tells us, hoping that that will be useful.